So for today's video, we're going to be talking about range of motion assessment for the glenohumeral joint. Now, because of the position of our patient, we're specifically going to be looking at passive range of motion with and without goniometric assessment, as well as overpressure and end fields. Recognize you could also look at active range of motion in this position. However, it is a gravity eliminated or reduced position. And so if we wanted to look at active range of motion, we more than likely would use a seated or a standing position, and then we could move towards this position. Since our patient is in supine, let's proceed with passive range of motion. Now I'm gonna come around to the opposite side of the plinth here so that you can see on this side that's closest to the camera. And I'm also gonna bring my patient up on a high-low table. Be mindful of body mechanics as you're taking these measurements such that I'm at a closer working relationship so that I'm not having to really bend over to gain my measurements. Now you'll notice I'm approaching him from kind of the head down. You can also approach in this direction. The difference is, is that you're gonna to have to move and that's okay, just be mindful of that. But when you're assessing passive range of motion, you have three joints that you have to be aware of. And so you should have already screened the wrist and hand and the elbow to make sure there are no confounding variables there. But at this point, we're ready to begin passive range of motion. Now, passive range of motion has to be just that. It has to be passive. If the individual is guarding, if they're holding tone or they're apprehensive of the movement, they're far less likely to actually allow you to do the movement, thereby making it passive. One way that you can increase the likelihood of that is by not moving them from this position but by coming in and fully supporting the arm. You'll note at this point, I have the wrist against my body and elbow. I have my forearm along their forearm, so there's a lot of contact. And then my hand is actually at and above the elbow, approximately. So I have the upper extremity fully supported. At this point, I can move into adduction. I can work into degrees of flexion. If I were to switch to flexion, notice at all times I have one hand on my patient and now I'm using my body to come into contact with their arm. The more surface area or the more contact between your body and theirs, the more likely they're going to be able to relax and allow that movement to occur naturally. As we move into flexion, notice how I transition. So initially is against my body and I'm holding here, but as we move into that greater degree of flexion, I can pivot with my feet and come back to that position that we saw before, which is where the wrist and hand is supported by my elbow, my forearm is along theirs, and I'm right at the elbow and proximal. This now enables me to get into that lower level of flexion while still having one hand free to take a goniometric measurement. Now in this case, if we were taking flexion, be mindful that the pillow can block end range of motion. So you may ask them to lift their head and neck for a moment, slide the pillow over, and then relax. The beauty of a high-low table like this, if you have somebody that's hypermobile, is you can also move the headrest out of the way. But in this case, let's presume that this individual has about right there as their passive end, we can grab our goniometer, axis of rotation is the joint, our stationary arm is the trunk, we're then looking for the lateral epicondyle of the elbow, and we have 172 degrees passive shoulder flexion. Now, we can also look at end fields and overpressures here. For that, we want to come in, now I'm using my uh, thigh to support the arm, my other hand comes closer to the joint, and we can look at overpressures. Now, the challenge in this position is we're not necessarily stabilizing the scapula. We can use the table as somewhat of a block, but there are others who would recommend that you actually slide your hand underneath, allow the table to kind of hold on to the arm, and then provide the overpressure there. That is somewhat patient dependent. If you have someone that's very, very guarded or holding a lot of tone, 
you may not be able to just kind of allow that extremity to hang out in space and get the arm or hand under to stabilize the scapula. So take that with a grain of salt. So we've looked at flexion already. Additionally, in this position, we can also look at abduction. Now with abduction, once again, we can start in this lower position, approximating our body with theirs. But then as we move overhead, we can pivot here, or we can also pivot as such. Again, anytime we're moving our body slow in methodical movements, keeping lots of surface area in contact in and with our patient. With horizontal abduction, just as we saw with flexion, we can take a goniometric range of motion assessment. Now instead of the trunk here, we switch and we're looking more at the orientation of the trunk and xiphoid process. Axis of rotation stays the joint, and then we're looking through the humerus to the lateral epicondyle. Additionally, we can also look at external and internal rotation. Now for that, we need to have our patient slide to the other side of the table. And if we take the range of motion measurement here, one of the things that you'll note is that we're below horizontal. Here's horizontal, here's the resting position. Now the challenge with this is now we're in a horizontally abducted position. We need to be more in a neutral or even slight scaption position because the scapula is 30 degrees oriented into the frontal plane. So how can we do that? Lucky for us, on these treatment tables, there's a little headrest. So if we grab that and we slide it under the distal humerus, that better aligns our articular surfaces between the actual glenoid and, and, and humerus. And so now we're ready to assess internal and external rotation. When we move into internal rotation, one of the things we're palpating for is the acromion. When the acromion starts to lift and kind of come along for the ride, yes, can we get more internal rotation? Absolutely, but look what's happening here at the shoulder. Just watch the shirt. We're going to fold the shirt tight so you can kind of see what happens. We move into internal rotation and look what happens. Whoop. There goes the shoulder, comes right along for the ride. So we need to palpate the acromion as soon as we start to feel that move. It's no longer the joint that's moving, but now it's the scapula that's tipping anterior. And so that's where we would stop the range of motion and take our measurement. Conversely, we can also look at external rotation. With external rotation, we're palpating for the inferior tip of the uh, scapula, and when that begins to move, that's going to stop our range of motion, or we can also palpate more anterior as well. Most of the time, individuals, uh, if they're following kind of a, a capsular pattern, which there's some debate that are recognized, uh, may be limited in both of these uh, ranges of motion. Additionally, we can also look at a couple other planes of motion for the shoulder. For this, though, we need to have our patient slide all the way back to uh, the opposite side of the table, essentially to where their trunk is all the way next to the edge. Make sure you're coming in to block them so there's safety that's at, uh, at play. But now we can look at things like shoulder extension. We can look at horizontal adduction. Assessing the posterior shoulder. This is also known as Tyler's test, which we'll discuss later. And then also horizontal adduction, looking more at the anterior shoulder. With all of those, we'll let them slide back onto the table. With all of those, we can take goniometric range of motion. All of those typically are going to be assessed passively in this position, and all can be assessed with or without an overpressure or an end field. Make sure we know what the expected end field is, whether that is tissue stretch, a capsular, a more firm or hard pattern, as well as what our norm uh, values are for range of motion to determine whether or not someone is hypo or hyper, that being in excess or too little, with their mobility. So, have a go with a peer or colleague. Make sure you have a goniometer close at hand. It helps if you're on a high-low table such that you can adjust it to your height and to uh, benefit the security of your patient. And spend time 
getting comfortable placing your hands on your patient in different positions, pivoting with your feet, and, and also practicing some other variables and get input from your, your peer, your colleague, as to where and how they feel most comfortable and most relaxed. If your patient's not relaxed, really kind of loosey-goosey, before you start moving, you can give a little bit of an oscillation to help them, but overall, if they're contracted, co-contracting, guarding, holding tone, you're not gonna be near successful with your assessment. So, have a go, and let me know if there's any questions.